And this book is called No Ajahn Cha Reflections. No Ajahn Cha. In the front part, it starts out with somebody walking up and saying, Are you Ajahn Cha? And he says to him, There is no Ajahn Cha to an advanced student. But if he knows the student is a beginner, he says, yes, this is Ajahn Cha. how do you do? Yes, this is the place where we teach. See, he's living, he's practicing with, without an identification. He's actually practicing, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, this is just me, the, the structure here. And he's practicing. <clears throat> get a lot of questions about how to take this whole thing in life and <clears throat> so see if you can identify with this this next one at first this is the process of your practice at first you you hurry to go forward hurry to come back and hurry to stop like that's your, your practice session. You continue to practice like this until you reach the point where it seems that going forward is not it. Coming back is not it. And stopping is not it either. It's finished. There's no stopping. No going forward, no coming back. It is finished. Right there, you find out that there is really nothing at all. Now, if you have come to our retreats or done an online retreat, we probably asked you to go to Sutta number 148, Chichaka Sutta, and I remember I was at Joshua Tree, California, one of those early retreats. And there was a student walked up to me with eyes just that big after the talk. And he said, there is just nothing there except consciousness, cognizing that it's just consciousness. Nothing else is there. In this way, we would say to you that this is so basic, this practice. It is, it's pretty simple to explain and simple to give you instructions. So why isn't it easy and we just all just move along? It's because of being full of everything in this lifetime from the time you were born to here when you start to practice and then your thoughts about all of that and the future are coming up and down while you're practicing it gets in the way yeah so you hear this when he's talking like this he then says remember you don't meditate to get anything but to get rid of things. So you're doing a persistent form of abandonment, right? And, and it says, we do it not with desire, but with letting go. If you want anything, you won't find it. Now, how many times have you heard me say the same thing to you? There's like when we talk about the laws in meditation and try to look at those. And we say, you know, if you want it, you can't have it. So we tell you to go to the practice. And when you sit, the, what you do is you go there simply like a two-year-old would peek around the corner in a room, into a room just to see what happens next. In that case of the two-year-old, just to see who's in the room. And when they're that age, they're playing with you and you're peeking, you know, peeking around the corner. Who 
money's there, what's next? Not something you're going to make come next, just something that's going to happen. And then what do we know about what's happening? Whatever arises in the view of the eye or the sound to the ear, it wasn't there. And there was a contact, it is there. And then it exists and it's falling away, it's not there, right? And so you know that's going to happen every single time. So there's, it's a, it's a process of knowledge, isn't it? That makes the meditator get better as they're going along the path by the knowledge of how things actually work. Now, if we think of that one, the knowledge of how everything actually works. And we remember the Upanisa Sutta, we've talked about that here a number of times, right in the middle of the line, the development line for the transcendental dependent origination. That's what Upanisa Sutta is. And you remember you had the, the line of dependent origination, which talked to you, that's the, the uh, co-arising, dependent co-arising, where the links in dependent origination are operating up to the point of suffering. But then there's another line hooked onto it. So you end up with 23 links instead of 12. And when you get to the aging and deaths and then sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, it flips over to having faith, starting to practice, experiencing the pamoja, which is relief, just the relief of sitting still, leaving the vibration outside and just sitting still is the pamoja. You know, pamoja turns into the uplifted joy, the PT. And whenever the PT fades away, then you have tranquility come up. And when the tranquility comes up, then when that fades away, you have sukha. That's the Buddhist happiness, which is an internal content contentment. And it's an internal uh, contentment due to knowing how this has worked up to that point too. That's the sukha. Then when you come out of that point from the sukha, you notice there is a collectedness that is a productive level of collectedness. You've established that. And you go back into practice and the next link is called knowledge and vision of how things actually work. That's the one, okay? Following that one is the nibbida. And the nibbida is the disenchantment, right? And then the next one is the dispassion. And then after the dispassion is the moody, and that's a liberation point. And then you, well, you fall into, you can say neurota is the next thing that really happens there, the cessation. And then you come out and you experience the opening, the experience of the Nibbana. Yeah, so he left us a lot, didn't he, the Buddha? He left us a line of how exactly that suffering happens. He gave us the symptom of the arising for the craving. And if we practice properly, we're beginning to get less and less tension as we practice the four steps of right effort correctly by using the six R's. And as we lower the tension, then when the tension rises up at that point, you know you're watching the symptom for craving coming up. So you can catch the release point, the recognition and the release point sooner and sooner each time. That's the beauty of this practice. Now, one of the things about this practice is you, you, it won't work if you change the order that the instructions are. 
if you start just smiling and smiling and smiling and smiling, it's not going to work. <laughs> if you have to, you have to relax, smile, and come back. And each time that you let go, you release, and then you relax, you drop down a little bit with your tension and tightness down the level is going down. Going towards what? Going towards the point where you can experience cessation. Such a unique practice. It's a remarkable thing that he found. And he found it where? Did he find it in all four of the texts? No, he did not. He found it by using the regime in Nikaya. Why is that so important? The early setup for Bhante Vimala Ramsey's training only involved the Majjhima Nikaya. I talked to him last week when I was with him. And I said, you know, how do you feel about all this stuff going on with the Samyutsa Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, blah, 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 blah. He's on the same page as I'm telling you that the Majjhima Nikaya has the whole entire teaching in it. And that the next book to consider is the Samyutta Nikaya as support structure for what's in that book. And the Anguttara Nikaya being a practice, a way of practicing with the numbers of different things for the preservation of the material to remember it. The, so the pieces don't get lost. He's really on the same page with me on this. This was other students that moved away from this. And it is causing some confusion because if people start diving in and talking about the practice and trying to analyze the practice from using the support structure only without the Majjhima Nikaya, eliminating it, it doesn't work. He never would have found it. He would have gotten too complex too soon. It's like when somebody tells you something like me talking too fast, too much, too fast, too soon, makes it so you can't understand it. So we put out a, a, a basic call to people about my talks, set them at 0.75 speed. <laughs> and then they come out perfectly and you can understand them just fine, okay? It happens that I grew up in Philadelphia and Philadelphia and New York are just killers for people talking too fast. We have the Italian community, the Sicilian community, the German community, the Jewish community, the Catholic community, everybody is talk, 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 talk. You see, we grow up with that. So I'm trying, but the solution, don't waste me, okay? <laughs> just put it on point seven five. If you don't know how, Call May, she'll tell you. Call Dama Gavesi, he'll tell you. Call um, them in England, they'll tell you. Hugh will tell you, Sarah will tell you. Put me at 0.75 and you can probably just write it down. It's right there, okay? Okay, enough of that. The other one that's on the page here is that he, he um, this is Ajahn Chagan. He takes the heart of the path is quite easy. That's true. Like I just said to you, it's easy to teach you to use the six R's. There is no need to explain anything in great length. Let go of love and hate and let things just be. Boy, that hits home, doesn't it? That's all that I do in my own practice. So he's basically saying, that um, there's no stopping, there's no going forward and pushing, there's no coming back again and again and that way. It's finished when you figure out there was really nothing at all except what's in the present time that gives you enough chance to figure out in an, in an experience you're going through what is essentially happening? You remember that from your, from if you're saying your precepts, I have to get the water here for a minute. Okay. If you are saying your precepts in the morning and you're saying the phrases we give you, 
Uh huh. Then you always hear what is essential is essential and what is unessential is unessential is the mind of the sage. It's not always easy, is it? <laughs> but things are happening and moving along quite fast. But what it's saying is stop, look, listen, like you're at a railroad track with this person standing in front of you going blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, and try to grasp what is the essential part here in what I'm saying is that this, these six pieces don't mix them up, do them in order. And what it's supposed to be doing is help you to pause that split second in your mind or longer as you watch what's happening and listen and you find out what is essentially happening in the incident. For those of you who didn't hear it before, I, we had the incident of the young man who was a soldier and came home and fell in love and was gonna get married. And his fiance went to work one morning, forgot something at the house, went back and opened the door and her fiance was kissing another woman in the living room. She'd never seen her before. She really got upset. <laughs> Two weeks before the wedding, really upset. Jumped to conclusion, slammed the door and went to her mother's house instead of work, okay? And the gist of this thing was in short, just very short, is it was his sister. <laughs> It was his sister who unexpectedly found out she could come back for the wedding. And she had been in Iraq also. And she came back and everything got patched up. But jumping to the conclusion so suddenly to an unessential conclusion that caused havoc for about a week or more until everybody kind of grasped the truth, sis has come home for the wedding. Wow. Wow. But it's a natural thing. If we grew up and we saw people doing that, that's how we do this. Somebody said to me the other day, how does everybody get these bad habits? How do we get all these bad habits? We get them because we grew up watching them all around us. That's what happened, that's all. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna dive into somebody else. We will, we will visit Ajahn Chah's little book each time probably I talk to you. We might do it at least one little page like that. That was really good. Okay, here this one is really fun. Um, let's see. I, may, I didn't give you an announcement for this, but what I was trying to figure out what to write you and tell you because I was gonna tell you how to climb a tree. <laughs> and you're there like, what are you supposed to climb a tree for? Well, listen to what is happening here. He was talking, this one is about Christianity and Buddhism, this book. This is a little book he wrote. I don't know if you can see it there. Can you get it? Christianity and Buddhism. It's a free booklet. And I had gotten it many, many years ago. And I brought, I ended up with going back to visit Bonte suddenly and no luggage and managed to get two suitcases out of a shed and come back with books. <laughs> so now that's what happened to me. Okay. Um. He gave some discussions. The book is about three lectures he gave to three universities at graduation time that were religious universities. And he did these really beautifully because they're marked out topic by topic, one step at a time. And one of the subjects is something that all of you I know have had a discussion somewhere at some time with someone about, you know, why are we doing meditation? Why are we even having to have religion to be balanced? What's that about? So this one, I'm gonna read part of a section of this. Thus, we should be flexible to the extent that 
we acknowledge that every group of people speaking different languages and living in different corners of the world has without exception something of its own which has a characteristic of God. When a given group of people is still in the early ages of civilization, that group will have a limited understanding of what is called God or considered God, or their conception of God will be in a primal stage of evolution. But we should not think that their conception of God is wrong or that it should, should we think that uh, we should take the extreme of not granting them any conception of God at all. Nevertheless, their conception of what is called God will evolve and mature to perfection eventually. It is our duty to help further the evolution in the spirit of the words that, for instance, Jesus quoted earlier, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In a way, this is what happened in the process of Buddhism coming when so many things were happening. And here comes the Buddha to show up and fulfill and straighten out very clearly what the nature of everything actually is. This is what this is what he's trying to show. And this is this is Buddha Dasa. I'll talk to you about Buddha Dasa in a minute. He's no longer with us either. But he was an activist. He was someone who always kept asking questions. And he was trying to look very closely, like we do here at exactly what happened, how it happened, and why it happened in relationship to the culture, everything when it came to Buddhism. So let's go on. As for preachers, they may be prophets or they could be apostles who have achieved what should be achieved by them. They preach the truth about God as much as possible, which is suitable as for their place and their time in their culture. Although they may not always use the manner of expression to which the common man is accustomed. That's a familiar issue in all the religions you look at is the level for the common person, the average person, and then the academic, the priest, it goes on and on, how they look at religion, what they try to figure out through the different means at the different levels of observation. We can, however, expect that the essence, the message, as regards truth is the same. And even if there are at times verbal discrepancies, the spirit of the preachings has nonetheless the identical objective of achieving the best thing man can eventually achieve. All the religions come about initially for a purpose of balancing, is what he's talking about. Now, when people fail and commit mistakes in the present day, uh, they are to regard them as lessons as they go along. Many granted by God so that they may lead their lives properly and more smoothly in the future. This is why we talk to you about taking practice into life for the purpose of smoothing out life for the purpose of a happier existence, a calmer mind, a clearer mind, one that considers what the essence of what's essential or unessential so that they don't get stuck in the unwholesome mind states. 
He does this so it can lead them for their lives uh, to be more steady in the future. One's bitter experience alone is effective enough to alter the course of your mind towards discovering a new way which will ensure that you do not undergo unpleasant experiences endlessly. The preacher of truth will help to find out such methods in a comparatively short time. And indeed, this is something that is worthwhile for the human being. This is the best a preacher can do for a troubled mind, reducing the time element to the minimum length and for every person is to take due time in accordance with the law of learning lessons by experience before he will be able to find his way out of trouble. God, or if you like the word or the universe and nature has created man to think freely and to make his own decisions. And on that ground, let us all use the working hypothesis with regard to the accuracy of the statement, there is an apostle for every nation. This is why we have different religions. Now the next point, which requires flexibility and it requires flexibility and a willingness for mutual understanding is the fact that nowadays people study their respective religions in a way which may be compared to climbing up a tree starting from the top. I love this. Which is quite contrary to the way of climbing in the days of the Buddha. For at that time, the way of approaching truth was like climbing a tree by starting from the foot of the tree. To explain nowadays, we have mountains of scriptures that are beside us on the desk, both the text and the commentaries are there. We study religious literature with weary and dewy eyes to such an extent that our heads are full of ready-made facts seen from various angles, say from the viewpoint of religion or philosophy or literature or science. And this manifold knowledge of ours with reference to the scriptures fails to enable us to effectively choose what suits us the best in which we can then take refuge. So the, the seeker is trying to find something out there that will calm the mind, identify the difference of the effects of unwholesome mind states or wholesome mind states upset us or soothe us in life, you see? We know this from our practice. Now, the more we study the scriptures, the less we know of the essence of the religion, whatever it is. As a matter of fact, the essence of the religion can only be reached by one thing, genuine practice. How many times do we say this? Genuine practice is worth 10,000 hours of sitting and reading. Absolutely, absolutely. Why? Because Godama was attempting to show you the way out was to see and understand, experience and use what he taught so that you fully took it internally, you see to understand how it works, everything. This is what is meant by when you want to um, get stuck in this position they're talking about, this is what is meant by climbing down the tree from the top. 
as it is practiced nowadays in almost every religion. As for the men of olden days, they had no scriptures whatsoever. And we may say that they were virtually illiterate before they started treading on the way of what they called religion. When they set out, they progressed gradually only after having understood just one or two points of a verse that pointed towards the truth, not the whole thing. Many times we hear a sermon based on one or two tiny points, and then we take off. The question is, did the listeners get the basis and core structure they needed of the teaching before they are listening that way? So these things have stages of practice. So if you're frustrated, you just don't get this. Are you caught in that loop, how that works? So thus, we, they, they could reach the essence of religion in the same way as one who climbs up the tree, starting from the foot of the tree, if they are testing it. For this, reason all of us in the world should be broad-minded and willing to recognize and cope with the state of ignorance which is widespread among all people whether they be conscious of it or not the interpretations of various religions point to be different they tend to be different so much so that we get more and more separated from each other, possibly even to the extent that we shall at times, we will begin to develop feelings of hostility towards each other. And it's because different people have their heads stuffed up with different facts, reached from different approaches. Everybody stresses his own particular viewpoint. Be assured that if Christianity would have been introduced in India in the days of the Buddha. It would have been welcomed warmly as a friendly religion or brother religion with open arms because in those days, people were broad-minded enough to firmly believe in the principle of these three paths to emancipation. Then he talks about something that is really interesting. The path of Panyadika with the wisdom factor that is predominating. And the second one is the path of Sadhyadika with the Sadha factor, faith factor of confidence and trust predominating. And the third path is of Viryadika with the willpower factor predominating, which is the one where you keep on practicing, no matter what. You incorporate it into everything you're doing so that while you're living, you begin to think more clearly, stop, pause, see what's essential, make decisions, respond, not reacting. Now you may select any of these three paths according to the individual's temperament. Buddhists, even nowadays, accept the principle, this principle, which is just in conformity with the nature of human beings and which the Buddha has pointed out very well. If one thinks impartially with an unbiased mind, everybody will agree. Buddhism tends to be the Panyadika, the one with wisdom, the path with the wisdom factor predominant as the goal, that Christianity tends to be the Sadhyadika with faith and trust and confidence where faith predominates. And Islam, the Wiryadika, the path where willpower is predominant. Thus, each of these three religions has one of the three paths as a special characteristic.
But strictly speaking, none of the above religions provide only one of the paths mentioned. Each one comprises all the three ways and only diff is only different in that each one may give preference in one way or another as you learn it. And in Christianity, the way of faith is given preference before the other ways of, uh, as has been said above, as to how the other two ways of wisdom and willpower may also be found in Christianity. That's something I discuss later in this little book. But presently, it's sufficient to point out that each of the religions does have all the principles of truth, the Dhamma, which man requires, such as trust, the faith, willpower, the energy, wisdom, loving kindness, the metta, generosity, selflessness, egolessness. And if we want to know why the particular one stresses this or that or prefers this or that point, then we should take into account to whom it was taught first, when it was taught, where geographically the religious teaching or sermon was given. Then we will, we should begin to know what kind of people under this, which circumstances and at what places such teachings were given in what time. So in this connection, we all have to be careful not to allow the knowledge we get through climbing a tree, starting from the top, to cover the true facts up of what we're doing and let that knowledge not be a barrier that we learn in the way of compassion and broad-mindedness as far as the adherents of each religion are concerned this is stressed, the generosity, compassion, and broad-mindedness. Let that knowledge not be a hindrance on our way of cooperation and peaceful coexistence, and stay, let, not, let us stand on our way of performing our duties in life in accordance with the right objectives of each respective religion, which has a code of morality and ethics. So that's as far as I'm gonna do for you, just that one. And open this up to a little bit of how you feel about talking about this this way, because this is important you understand. What are we doing when we're learning twin? Why, why, were, why was I interested for a couple of years, very interested to know how is this gonna go into your life and become active? How is it working with neuroplasticity in the brain where we're building a new neural pathway for patience, equanimity, and balance, you see? The, the balance and what are we doing? How is this working? And does it making sense for you in your life to remember your precepts, to guard yourself against your hindrances, to remember perhaps the faculties. You know, I had a habit when I was learning all these pieces, I thought that's a lot of pieces. You know, my aunt many years ago said, Buddhism, oh my gosh, that's got so many pieces. She was in philosophy major and she was quite something. But she thought, that's a crazy thing to consider. So many pieces, pieces, pieces. But come to find out the pieces are actually coming together like the wheel that works like this as it turns. And they're all structurally connecting together, you see? That's the thing that's impressive about the practice. So I'm gonna throw it out for you just a minute here and toss it out and just see, what do you think about this? How does it strike you? I 
I catch you Pulton over there. Sure. I thought you had a puppy for a minute. Yeah, sorry, no, we got cross feed there. Um, it's okay. uh, so what I've what I've taken from the the you, what you were saying um, is something which seems very present in 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 the practice um, uh, the twin practice, uh, and which is different to other forms of practice is the, how readily you can move it into daily life, and uh, this sensitivity to. Um, uh, tension um, and also uh, something which uh, Venerable Dharma Gavesi said uh, the other week I found very helpful which was also recognizing in the precepts that um, when you when you do follow the precept when you when you do um, uh, see your action and choose a different way of, of behaving um, and uh, and recognizing, uh, if you like, the successes of that, rather than just focusing on when it doesn't happen. Um, so the combination of the tension uh, in the twin meditation and that perspective on the precepts, I think, is really does help bring it into daily life. The kind of balance. Oh, yeah. Yes. Because it's all about bringing balance. Balance. It in. is. Yeah, exactly. Um, recently, some people felt that that um, it's not balanced and goes in the wrong way. And I had to read what they wrote about it. And I'm there. Well, if they were doing an online retreat or if they were in a retreat the first thing you would pick up about what's being written or said was that the, the six R's are not in the right order. They're not being practiced correctly. And that somewhere, somehow, and this is one of the things we do know, uh, is that our, our teaching system is not as unified as it should be. Our, we, we admit this, you know, because we had to let people start teaching. They wanted to share this, but if you start putting things in different orders than they were in the text. And I, I'm very, you know, people who study with me, they say, you're kind of really strict about that. I said, well, if for instance, I give you the, even, even the uh, five precepts in a different order than they're normally seen in the text, I think I'm disturbing something because what I started realizing last year, uh, this is about maybe a year back, was you know how incredibly causally related each group is in the structure, for instance, of the 37 requisites of enlightenment in the, when we're learning about the practice. So even faith, energy, mindfulness, um, concentration, and wisdom, if you put that on a paper and start looking at it and considering it, there's a causal relationship in the discovery and growth of that group, you see? And when you look at, um, when you look at um, the four foundations of mindfulness, you can even do it with that. The body, feeling, mind, and dhammas. Now mix them up and put them in another order on the paper and look at them and tell me if you would have discovered the attributes and the support they give you for development the same way if you had looked at them in a different order. It's interesting to play this game, you see? And um, so we don't wanna um, be abrupt if someone has a bad experience to say a blanket, maybe this isn't a good practice or something to anything because of the way that you, when they're, when they're writing about it, how it could get very, very mixed up. And the reason I'm so strict about it is because if you're going to start reading, maybe not at the time I'm teaching you the parts, but if I'm teaching you them in a different order, like the um, uh, lust and greed, hatred and aversion, and then I'm teaching you restlessness and then sloth and then doubt and then sloth and torpor, 
I'm teaching you in a different order from the text. So let's look at the order of that in the text. It was lust and greed. I want it mind attachment is where it goes. Hatred and aversion. I don't want it mind it goes to that aversion side. Sloth and torpor, slow, dull, sleepy mind. Okay, is what happens first as you're struggling to learn the practice and first developing. Okay, so if you put restlessness there first, it doesn't usually happen that way when you're teaching people. This is just coming from me because I've done hundreds and hundreds of students now. And, and I keep an eye on all this stuff. Is it, ha do they develop in different orders? No, they develop in different speeds usually. And the speed of how they're developing can be slowed down if they've got things mixed up out of order is what I found. So after sloth and torpor, we had restlessness, guilt, and remorse. That, that comes up, okay? And then the doubt is the one down at the bottom. Doubt can be stuck anywhere. It's kind of an overall lying thing. But when you bump into sloth and torpor and you feel like you're caught in restlessness and can't let it go, you're forgetting the law of restlessness about the nutriment and how it operates, you're forgetting the knowledge about that. And you have to go back. So the, the secret most of the time when you're sharing this with somebody is to go back and ask them, don't tell them, but go back and just ask them, tell me what the six R's are, the very basic question and listen to them, write it down and see how they send it to you in a report or they say it to your face on a on, on the Zoom or in, in person, listen very carefully. Because the years I worked with Bonte and all those retreats, this is like almost 100 retreats. I was trying to re rewrite what they were in the last um, 16 years of how many retreats that I had attended with him. And it wasn't until 2007, when I think we were in South Korea, that, the, 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 that it popped up his advice system, which I thought was so extraordinarily sharp and just so bright and just so genius, you know, the way he coaches people was actually being fed to him in the in interview. Like, you don't know your lines, okay? We're in the scene together, you know, you and you don't know what your lines are gonna be. But if you listen really carefully to me in the play, you'll remember your lines because I'm gonna feed them to you by what I say in my script to feed you. And then you start remembering your, your lines. And we found out that when the student is in front of you and you're giving them only the five questions, no more than those five questions, no, just the five questions, you're gonna get everything you need. And they're gonna talk from those five questions, okay? Um, and they're gonna hand you and tell you exactly where they are and tell you exactly what's wrong. And you're gonna see that they need more energy or clarity or uh, more tranquility or more energy as you go along. So you don't have to, um, you, you have all the knowledge in your head, but you don't have to jump out and start coaching them when they're speaking to you, answering those questions. If you're writing it down and then you just look at it, they're telling you exactly what to say back to them, what they need. You were here, so that means you're gonna fall into this next one. So this is gonna be your new one, quiet mind with X. And X could be clearer, brighter, uh, stiller, any of these adjectives. There's a whole collection of adjectives around quiet mind that sit there like, here's quiet mind. And then there's all these things around it that paint it or shade it to what it actually is when you're talking to them about it, that becomes your new object of meditation. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is uh, interesting how that works. Yeah. Do you have anything else? Anything else about this with the, the way the religious issues that face us today and I sit, sit in the heartland of the universe for many religions being around me. I can't tell you that, you know, here, 
uh, well, I was in a discussion, I guess, last week with someone, and it isn't, you cannot point to any of the print of the main religions. There's like five basic religions. You can't go to, into any one of those and say, that's it. Christianity is so diverse. Even the churches within Christianity that are the diversity are the, again diverse. When I look back, I remember going through the history of the Baptists dividing themselves in half and then dividing themselves again into three parts. And it was just the Baptists within the Christianity. But let's look at the Lutherans and the Methodists and the, they all come out with the reformed versions and this. And then we have the, the very eclectic ones um, in Buddhism, what happened? The Buddhist church happened. <laughs> You see, how do we get them to be Buddhist in the West? Well, we say we set up the church and the pews and we set up the uh, the organizational structure of the service. But then we we get a big bowl and whatever Buddhism you came from, you put it into that bowl and you stir it up. And then we have that structure, which is flexible and evolving. It seems like constantly from some friends I talk about that are members and what kind of music shall we have and what kind of this and that, because we had that, we don't want to leave that out. So we'll move over here. It's a fascinating evolution with that. Fascinating, you know, and that didn't exist. And all of a sudden it's there for probably 10, 12 years now. So, and that comes not committed. The people that built that structure and continue to build it are coming out of Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. And in Buddhism, if we go in either one of those doors, we've got, whoo, <laughs> you know, a bunch of variations sitting there before us. We say, we can say this is sort of because of the, um, what do you call that? Um, dilution of the Dhamma over time, that it just has a tendency to start here and then just, and then it goes spreads and then this spreads out underneath it and underneath it and underneath it is what's happening. Here's, what do you think? Uh, it's, it's um, I, I think it's an aspect of human nature that when things become popular uh, because they're in some ways working and talking to people, um, they get adopted and co-opted into different forms. And we see this with the secular mindfulness now. And so there's probably never been more people practicing mindfulness. Um, it, but what's happened is it's, it's spread out and become more shallow. Now, it doesn't mean the deep teaching's gone away uh, and the volume of deep teaching might be expanding, but the noise around mindfulness is around the shallow self. Uh, and so the recognition of what the teaching is becomes much more difficult to, uh, to see clearly uh, because the volume, you know, the shouting, if you like, is at the shallow level, which is very broad. And it takes effort then to distinguish between that and something else, which has always been there. And the difficulty is compounded by the fact that the shallow expression is using all of the language that would have been used to it to describe the, uh, the, the more profound teaching. And so the impact of the language becomes um, more, uh, uh, becomes faded. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, see, we see this in the yoga, we see this in, in meditation, um, in the mindfulness. Um, and the challenge is always how to embrace some of the shallow stuff because more people getting involved is very good and they get some benefit but also being able to differentiate what that is about compared to uh the the depth because they are different things um the shallow is very much more around meditation for an outcome or mindfulness for an outcome and uh and the deeper teaching is much more about uh not focusing on the outcome but focusing on the on the process and the and the development that that creates um, do you ever do you ever feel like you're um walking amongst um, a big car company and you're going from 
the concept through or for an automobile? I mean, because the concept of an automobile is pretty basic, it's never changed, it's never changed. But they certainly do change, the models change and they keep, they change, change, change all the time. But the concept stays the same. And the people are, are, feel like people are kind of attempting to do that, don't you think? To keep the, the uh, concept there, but I want to be able to say it my way. I mean, you know, and this is where uh, I, I ran into some, we're building a chart and I'm working with somebody building a chart. And then uh, I'm trying to be really open about what the person is doing with the chart. And it has, there's a lot of stuff on this chart. It's one of those, you know, things that's so huge and it's gonna make you remember all these pieces all over the place about Buddhism. But when, when um, what's the one? Okay, the one is like um, uh, Nama Rupa. You know, the link for Nama Rupa is, uh, met, we say mentality, materiality. And we make it, the reason we say it so simply in the way that it was designed that we used to teach, the chart that I built, Bonte and I went back and forth over thousands of miles of driving, <laughs> you know, about this every once in a while, we got stuck every, at least a couple times a week on this when I was driving so much those two years. And that's when this came into being. And it's so simple what we give you on that, but we try to get it down those definitions on that chart to where when we give you the definition, you actually will walk around the house and be able to recite the links and their definitions. We're trying to make it so that you can take it in and it's workable in the structure. So Nama Rupa, we say mind and body. We say mentality and materiality. And then we take it down even more. We keep going with the ice cream cone, reducing it down with deductive reasoning to the point where we say, the mental process of an ear hearing and the material process of this ear is this, but we dare not say the elements, bring the elements into the topic of Nama Rupa because then you're gonna wonder all about the elements. And if you consider how many books have been written about the elements, you go, oh my gosh, you know, the, the um, earth, the air, the, um fire and the water you see so we stayed away from it but in the last few years everybody wants to take earth air fire and water and put it into that also when you're talking about it the other one was consciousness formations and con you know ignorance formations consciousness consciousness what do we do with that 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 link in the beginning it's not one that you normally see just pure consciousness see not an easy thing to sit and say that you're going to be able to see that so that that if you take consciousness and you add at that point you start saying eyes ears nose tongue and body consciousness when you it was only a link of consciousness because the 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 um fact of the individual consciousness connected with the the sixth sense door should it shouldn't be mentioned until you get to the sixth sense doors then it should be mentioned on the way to contact because what you want to be sure you have is from the uh, idea of contact from the sixth sense doors when you take a person to contact you want to be sure nobody gets the impression that after formations, those individual consciousnesses exist. Because, because this, what you're really talking about with the consciousness link is like the gas tank for the automobile to drive. Get it? Yeah? Okay. It's just, the, it's just a storage place of somewhere in your body there is consciousness, but it's not, it's inactive until it goes through the sense door structure. So another spot where it got a little complicated was if you were to take uh, the four, four um, noble truths. And that one is very, I cannot tell you how dangerous it is if you start to elaborate or change the statement 
there is suffering, there is cause, there is cessation, there is path. And why? Why am I so adamant about that? Because the invitation has to be there when you say it. And what I mean is when you say a statement, it can be a statement of fact or a statement that leaves a fact that you leave the door open to investigate. But if you start to elaborate anything into that sentence beyond there is this, there is that, there is this, and there is the path to take you to that. You close down the invitation. If you chop the invitation off, the person, the young person, this is what happened with the, the teenagers. If I say, <coughs> All life is suffering. No reason for the Buddha to come. <laughs> That's what they said to me. There was no reason. If all of life is suffering, all the time, the, if the aggregates themselves are suffering, but that's not true, is it? The aggregates, when affected or if affected by clinging, are suffering. Do you see what happens? And the kids get up and they just walk out. They don't want to even stay. So they wonder why they're having trouble in Thailand for the kids leaving. Well, because they're doing this, they're playing with it. There are certain translators that are helping them do it. And they don't catch this if they're second language. They think all of suffering and there is suffering is the same thing, but it's not. Yeah get tricked. So Buddha Dasa, what he was doing was trying to get you back to basics. In this particular uh, discussion, he's trying to get you to look at, don't you climb that tree from the top? What does that mean to me? I have students that come to me all the time. So when are you going to give us, just give it to you in a box like this. Here it is at the box. The solution to everything in your life and the end of suffering. <laughs> I don't want to work. I don't want to do anything. I just want you to tell me, like I'm the guru, God, or something, the answer. And that's not Buddhism. Buddhism, the teacher, is not the, you have to do it this way. It is not the guru. This is the absolute. He can tell you the absolute truth, sure. But actually, it doesn't do you any good if the guru tells you the absolute truth and you don't do the work of getting there gradually. If he gives you the top of the tree statement, you still need to go up the tree from the bottom to the top to learn it. Isn't it true? Yeah. So how does this, this affect you other guys? How does it work? Jay, what do you think about it? I'm going to tap on you, you know. <laughs> Paul, what do you think about it? This is where it gets fun, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, in class, I told you the story of my friend in Sri Lanka about questions. And we both had a problem at two different universities trying to get kids, young people to ask questions or just keep questioning until you really get it in a place where you really see, see it. She walks in at lunch and she says a bunch of four by or five by seven cards in her purse. And she says, I have solved the problem of questions. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to give the person a question and they have to say it before they leave the class. <laughs> Go ahead, May. Uh, Sister Kema, I don't really have a question, but more of an observation. Um, I think uh, the translation of the word um, tanha or cra uh, craving, is still mm -hmm. a lot of people that think it is um, desire, 
Uh, I recently came across another Dharma talk somewhere. I can't remember where. And it gives people the perspective that it is in Buddhism, it is wrong to, to, to want things or it is, it is wrong to desire. Um, I, <laughs> and when I heard no, I, that, yeah. yeah. I understand this perfectly. And this is what, an example I also use. Um, craving, you know, the, um, to say desire, well, listen to, listen, listen to this one that was perverted, where you take the cause, instead of saying there's a cause of suffering, there is a cause, they wrote it this way. They said the cause of suffering is desire. Now, this is a point when you change it, and this probably came from that kind of a, a, a description of the Four Noble Truths, and it, that's why it's so dangerous, okay? Because if the teacher says to you, the cause of suffering is desire, and they stop talking, you are doomed to do exactly what you just described. Well, I don't want to be involved in this. They're saying that I shouldn't want anything. If you go there to the extreme, you are going to an unessential conclusion of this examination of cause and of desire. But desire has the word chanda and chanda is a neutral word. When they say it's a neutral word, this is what they, they've said in the Pali department to me. This is one of those neutral, a neutral word. It's like a flexible word. Chanda can be appear as the word chanda, but it can mean wholesome desire or unwholesome desire. So this is where you take I like, this is where you might be playing. It's a good example. You might be playing with something in the Samyutta Nikaya or Anguttara Nikaya before understanding enough from the Majima Nikaya about how it, there are good things that you should be desiring in your life, especially uh, the lay person, okay? In the development of your relationships, the development of your marriage, development of your family, development of school, development of employment, and want to do good and to have an increase in your, your salary and things like that is all chanda is wholesome desire, very wholesome desire. Having money, there's nothing wrong with becoming rich if you're a Buddhist. I have had people come to me and say, you can't be rich, you're a Buddhist, you have to be poor. Wait a second, that doesn't, that doesn't work. <laughs> all the monks, they wouldn't have survived if nobody invited them to dinner. <laughs> You know, in the stories, you know, it never would have happened. So, so you have to understand there are things in life that are good and important for you to desire to follow your precepts, desire to spend time to work towards the experience of the mundane and super mundane. Nibbana. All these things are wholesome desire. Okay, now let's look at this again from another angle. The advanced meditator ends up neither wanting nor having aversion. Desire or aversion completely disappears. But this is not something you're supposed to impose on yourself. You're not supposed to impose it on yourself and force this to exist in your life, thinking that you will get to the end of the path faster if you absolutely decide to just not desire anything at all, you see? This is something that was a description of the end result that happens naturally. And that's very different. This is, if we look, uh, you people here, most of you have been practicing for a time. And if you've been practicing for a while, have you experienced uplifted joy? And have you experienced more degrees of the degrees? Remember I'm saying degrees of equanimity stages of equanimity becoming stronger and stronger where these things never happened in your life now you experiencing them when you start to repeat what helped you experience them they become finally automatic there's four stages of the development of equanimity now we can take this example we could go into sailing a boat or riding a bike or playing tennis or developing handball, whatever sport you want to develop. Or we could take it and put it into the, the framework of a career or occupation that you have in life. 
and show you there's a beginner, there's a middle, and there's an end, and talk about the guilds that existed in the Middle Ages of the person who came and was a journeyman and then became this level and then that level and became the expert sculptor or painter or anything in the world, you can take this. But for some reason, because we don't, um, we don't talk about that very much anymore, so much in school, I don't think we hear it that much anymore. That kind of training and discipline in the West, the, 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 the person who develops real slow is the person who just doesn't have the discipline to follow the instructions and wait until the development occurs. They want this, they want the box for 1995, the solution to everything, <laughs> the everything box. And it's not, it doesn't happen in Buddhism. You have to put in the time and you have to develop the discipline. And if you are not practicing, I remember at one point I was not practicing for a while. And, excuse me. I was not practicing, but I was living it. And I didn't realize, I tried to figure something out. I stopped because something happened in my life for a few months. And when I came back, what I was observing was I was starting again, further ahead of where I stopped. And I wondered, why did this happen? How did this happen? What happened was the, I was advanced enough to internalize some things that were being used all the time in life, in life, within relationships and business and everything. Because of that, I was exercising the new neural pathway that I had attempted to unconsciously develop in my, in my brain, okay? And so when I came back, I was able to go deeper than when I had stopped. And how come that was happening? It wasn't just that you needed a break or you felt, or that you decided to take it, it was different. And I felt like I should have fallen back. It's true that if you get on a bike and you haven't been on one for a long time, bingo, you can drive. I mean, I went home and I hadn't driven for five years and I was driving just around the property, but I was driving in different parts of the property and visiting people out in this one area, not driving to town and on the highway and stuff, but just driving a little bit. And it's nothing to drive again, you see? So when you put it in the terms of driving, you don't lose your ability to drive a car or a truck or a tractor. <laughs> it all comes back very quickly, you see? Um, yeah. So it's a developmental thing. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely true what you're saying. But they have to look at the... This is why Buddha Dasa had said what he said about in this about who was it taught to, where did they live, where geographically were they? Here's an interesting thing to consider. That's I just somebody mentioned it to me that the political problems they have with different religions in the world, the majority of the problem is happening between religions that all were formulated in the desert. Did you ever think about that? Christianity came from the desert in Palestine. Yeah, Islam came from the desert. Judaism came from the desert. And those three have had a lot of uh, you know, conflict over time. And But when you go back and you look at the customs, the culture, the people, the way they, they would, would settle disputes and problems and dis discussions, and stuff like that, you see, you can see where there's a relationship there. That's, it's just interesting. But Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, Taoism, things like that, the Tao, the Tao that, you know, that came later, uh, all these things are came, it came the same similar time as Buddhism. But these things were, had a more patient aspect of sitting there and seeing what's essentially happening before reacting. They do have problems with each other. Don't get me wrong. There are some problems. We can go back and look at that in many parts. 
but it's a geographical, Buddha Das is trying to point out to you the geographical location of something actually has something to do with this and how the people in Any any other thoughts that anybody has? Just throw it out. <laughs> gotta get you guys. We gotta get somebody. We hire you know to go around with a little match to light underneath a person at the end of the time we do a short one, and then oh, I gotta ask a question. <laughs> That's what we basically did uh, with those kids in the in the university, Sarah. Okay, see you later, Sarah. Okay, anybody else? Okay, well, we, we had some interesting stuff today. Um, I had to do it this way, you know, because I don't have my books with me right now, all the books. But next time, I'm, I should be going home on Wednesday uh, back over to Lasagar. All we have now is they have to do a big surgery here and Give me stitches, mommy. I gotta have stitches. <laughs> gotta, and then I have to go let that heal. So, okay, anybody? Let's do our prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings. That we have. May suffering ones be suffering free and the uh, fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I think uh, she is also facing facing uh, uh, internet problem. <laughs> I also want to log out for uh, some time. Uh, yeah, this is I think so uh, internet related. Okay then. Bye. <laughs> All right, bye bye everybody. I'll discuss, Have a really uh, good week. And please, please, you know, take a little. I'll be calling you just now. Okay, I need to speak to you. Okay, I'll hang out. Okay, is it okay? Yeah, you I, stay I, here I, with. No, no, I'll call you. I'll call you. Oh, you think you'll call me? Okay. <laughs> I hope it goes through. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>